Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the first ever Bobby Khan Show. What we're going to do on this show, we're going to talk to cool people around Minneapolis, around St. Paul, hear what they're doing. Um, and I'm very honored on this very first episode of the Bobby Khan Show to have my good friend, Chris Bacon Tarbox. Bacon, what's going on? Hello, and welcome to the first ever premiere episode of The Bacon Show, starring me, Chris Bacon Tarbox, here at the stately Minneapolis Television Network in Minneapolis. I'm here with my first guest ever and my good friend, Bobby Khan. Bobby, how's life been treating you so far? All right, let's see. What, you're, you're, uh, you're, you're, no, you're, no, you're no guest to MTN here. You've been an MTN stalwart for years. You know how to do Photoshop uh, check. So you're an accountant, if I've been told correctly. You are a uh, host of a critically acclaimed series of dance classes here in Minneapolis. You were on Freaky Deaky. You were the host of Freaky Deaky here at MTN, which I was a part of, and I was very proud to serve alongside you. Tell me, Bobby, what have you been up to lately? What are you doing with your life? Well, uh, funny you should ask. I have this new uh, talk show that you're actually on right now. It's called The Bobby Khan Show. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to be sitting down with people like yourself, talking to interesting, interesting people who, like, for instance, know how to do Photoshop and know how to be in a band and play the triangle. And um, what we want to know is just how do you do it? Well, it's funny you should mention that, Bobby, because here on The Bacon Show, we talk to people about what they do in their life, how good they are with money, how good they are at dancing, how good they are at maintaining a solid beard. And you know what? You're my first guest. You're good at all three of those things. So we're going to set the tone for this soon-to-be legendary show, which is The Bacon Show, which is airing right now, which we are taping right now, because this is not your show. This is my show, The Bacon Show, not The Bobby Khan Show, not So You Think You Can Dance. It's The Bacon Show. Do you help people with their taxes, give them financial advice, and what kind of dance genres are you most fond of, like, you know, salsa dancing, hip-hop dancing, disco dancing, what, what's your poison? So, um, now, you know, we talk about my job, how about we talk, let's, let's talk about what you do, you do a very important role for the world that we need, and that's called being a journalist. So, what inspires you to write things about stuff. It's funny you should talk about my journalism career because in journalism part of my job is asking people questions so they can you know obviously answer them and funny enough being the host of this show that we're filming right now the bacon show a big part of my job is asking questions and so I'm gonna ask you a question right now what inspired you to start doing the Bobby Khan so you think you can dance dance class Oh, I think you mispronounced the Bobby Khan show. Um, what inspired me was I knew that I had, you know, cool people that I know that I could bring down here to be the guest. And as the host of my own show, I could, you know, talk to them and ask them what's going on in their life and, and you know, really make a difference for them because, you know, I already have my own show. To go back to the whole title of the show, I know it's easy to mispronounce bacon, Bacon, Bobby Khan, Bacon, Bobby Khan, Bacon. So I know, I know that it gets a little difficult for you. I mean, you work with with numbers, not words. So that's totally fine. But uh, this is the Bacon Show, and that's not going to change. We're going to be inter interviewing the cream of the crop in this fine city of Minneapolis, whether it's artists, musicians, dancers, maybe a magician or two. I love magic. How about you? Let me mediate for you, fellas. Nobody wants to watch Wake and Bake with bacon. They're too used to frying their bacon, even though that doesn't make as good of BLT sandwiches. They're not ready for it. And so you think you can dance? <laughs> I don't want to think after a long day at the office. I want to veg out. No. The people demand the Joe Rula show. But as it were, 
they're not ready for it. So, we're going to have to do something else. Ah, and now it's, uh, so now it's, and now it's, Well, my guest tonight, I'm very excited about. He is a legendary Minneapolis musician, and his new album is The End Is Not The End. Good friend of the show, good friend of MTN, and now a good friend of yours. And now it's Mark Malman. Mark. Hey, how you doing? Good, how are you, man? I'm very good today. Good to have you here. Yeah, thanks for having me. My, my pleasure. Um, how you been? You've been? You've been busy with the new album, but uh, you're just... What's this, your eighth studio album? This is, I think this is my eighth studio album. It might be my ninth or seventh. I don't know. Okay. Um, <laughs> I just read the paper and then <laughs> that tells me. Right. So it's like you, you just go on your Wikipedia page just to check in how many yes, albums you've Yes, I go down done. to the library and I ask for the Wikipedia and they go and pull out the... I don't have the internet, so I use right. the actual Wikipedia book, which is published. Oh yes, the, uh, every day. It's it's like a to it's one of one of many uh, series of books mm -hmm. that you get in gigantic tomes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's where they got the idea mm -hmm. from. Uh, so yeah, new album, and um, I take it you have a new volley of shows you're going to be doing to promote it. Yeah, yeah, we'll do shows and uh, tours and um, little things. You know, I mean that's part of the part of the job. It's rock and roll. So you've been putting out. At least eight studio albums since '98, I think it was. Mm -hmm. And it's like when you're on your off season, when you're not recording, are you just thinking up new songs in in between, or do you like ever take breaks, or is it just create, 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 create? You know, you take vacations mm -hmm. to a tropical island. <laughs> Actually, I've never been to a tropical island ever. It's pretty sad but um i haven't even been to the water park of america that should be uh, that should be something i do after oh yeah sure. i try to take a couple months off i've been writing like screenplays and stuff oh uh and uh you know to just uh keep keep the story different for every album you know right so you, you write screenplays yeah yeah i've written one full one and then like four uncompleted ones can you tell me anything about them One's about a uh, a motorcycle werewolf, okay. kind of like a, mo a gang of motorcycle werewolves, and uh, another one is about a internet werewolf. Okay. And how does how does that work? In I don't want I don't want to tell the whole story. You don't want to tell us? Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's all I'm gonna say. And then I've got another where I got a lot of werewolf scripts. Awesome. I'm, uh, three werewolf scripts, and then I'm working on the end of the world script. One thing I find really cool about you is that aside from your you know usual work working in music and playing shows you compose music for trailers for m film and television yeah uh, when did that start how'd you get into that business oh I, I around 2005 I think my first trailer was some music for a, a, a Sophia Bush movie called The Hitcher which was a remake mm -hmm. I did that for a while um, and then probably a while meaning like eight years or something mm. <laughs> and then uh you know but it, it a lot of those jobs that you know you really have to go full-time and music is my full-time thing so I, I switched and i started i did compose a uh a, a thing for Lionsgate, gate a, a, a zombie thing mm -hmm. called bite me too and then um and then i was just like you know I just want to focus on rock rock records mm -hmm. so I, I don't do i think the last trailer i did was x-men Days of Future Past. Days of Future Past, right? And then, and then, um, now I'm just doing really small, really small things. I try to focus on on the records and not let that side of the business take over. Okay. You know, but it, it when the money comes or when the jobs come, I take them. Okay. Uh, now you are also very well known for your marathons. Um, Hamill Griffin Cassidy, our fine director, who's yeah. in the uh, control room, was alongside you on your last one in 2012, and you. 
it, for those of you who don't know, uh, Mr. Malman traveled cross country uh, over, I think it was eight days. Yeah. And he made music continuously for all those eight days. And when he was asleep, he even had some sort of apparatus attached to your head that yeah. the electronic impulses turned it into just music. Just an EEG. Uh, just, it's just an EEG USB MIDI controller. Mm -hmm. And it was streamed on the internet the entire we time. We streamed the whole thing. It was the first, um, I mean, it, it was pretty, it was pretty important. And I think in years to come, and as it happens, like, it will, it's more recognized for what it was. But it was the first mobile cross-country musical webcast. Right. You know, live webcast. Because after we did Marathon 3, um, and we had 400 people in the room and 30,000 people watching, and that was in 2010, mm -hmm. or 25,000 people watching, or 40, or whatever. It changed all the time. You know, I was really thrilled. I was like, you know, I want, I want to do something that's, that's never been done. I want to do that again, you know? Something yeah. that's really never been done. So, yeah, Hamill, and we all did it, four of us. We did the whole thing. It was an incredible, massive project, and, and I'm still working on a documentary about it. Okay. We have footage, and, and that, i got to get that done, too. Now, how do you top that, though? Like, have you ever have you had any inkling of if you ever do another marathon, would you have to go <laughs> farther? You, would, you basically would have to go to space. space. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, the thing is, when, you make, when you're making something that's art, when you're making something that's, that's po that has a point, mm -hmm. then it's not about outdoing yourself. Right. Um, it, it's, it's about continuing the story and how... The, the thing relates to the other things. And I knew that in the beginning when I started, I knew that like at first they would call it a stunt and then they called it. Now, I mean, when we did the last one, you know, when we were at 30 Rock, they were calling it performance art, you mm -hmm. know, which is great. And so, um, you know, I, I think about it only a little bit. I know when the time is right to do another thing and call it marathon, it, it's going to be more complex and it's going to be longer and it's going to be uh, it, 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 you know, it, it won't, I don't, I try not to think in terms of how do I outdo myself okay. because then, then you get wrapped up in, in, um, in overpowering what you did before instead of letting everything be its own cool project, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm glad to see you're doing great. Um, congratulations on the new album. Uh, Mark Malman, The End Is Not The End. Um, pick it up, get it. Ladies and gentlemen, the incomparable Mark Malman. Thank Thanks. you very much for coming on. Mm -hmm. Good evening. My name is Dr. Llewellyn Myers, and this is Juggalo Rehab. Addiction, though a difficult and trying time for all those involved, can be treated through a combination of both therapy and guidance. But while some doctors treat those with either drug or alcohol addictions, I specialize in the worst affliction known to man, being a juggalo. Long considered to be the bastard children of musical subcultures, devout fans of the hip-hop duo Insane Clown Posse have been noted for their fervent loyalty to clown paint, lyrics pertaining to murder, and for whatever reason, the soft drink Fago. Widely misunderstood by society at large, juggalos are comprised of a massive cross-section of society that transcends race, skin color, or levels of hygiene. But for some Juggalos, the obsession is less dope than they'll let you believe. Meet Jake. In all my years in addiction counseling, his is one of the worst cases of Juggalitis I've ever seen. Jake was brought to my attention after he was arrested for shouting obscenities at pedestrians while reportedly defecating in a public mailbox. Yeah, I see a toilet. I use a toilet. I'll drop a nerd or whatever. These things don't play, Bianca. Yo, what we got tonight? We got Rowdy, Roddy Piper, back from the dead, and he's gonna be performing with Axel Rose and the Stone Roses. It's for the bleeders. It's for the bleeders! The bleeders and the bleaches! Cause the bleaches aren't no creatures. They're not creatures that crawl around with the hair and the stare and the werewolves. In the full moon. Yeah, you boop! Yeah, keep on honking! With cameras rolling, I began my attempt to set Jake on the right path. But I needed help. I had to call Curtis. A true success story if I've ever known one, Curtis was the textbook example of what it was like to be a real juggalo. 
Hopefully with his help, we could teach Jake the error of his ways in no time flat. What do they call you? Violent Jake? You think you're violent? You think you're tough? You think you're psychopathic? You think you're a psychopathic rider? What do you know about riding? What do you know? You think you, think you can hide behind this face? Behind this little face that you made, this facade? You think you can just like boil up all your little feelings into your dreadlocks? You think you like that fago? You think you like that fago? I like the fago. You, yeah. want, you want the fago? Yes, I you, want the fago. You want the fago? The fago wants you. It's refreshing. How much money you spend on that fago? Not much. My mom buys it. You want to act tough? You want to get tough? You know how many fights I got into at some of these juggalo concerts? You know how many people turned on me who I thought was my family? You know I almost took an ashtray, a glass ashtray, right to the face? I ducked out of the way. Poor innocent ba bystander goes home in a, in a gurney. You want that? You want your mom to find you in a hospital? Is that what you want? You want to you live this way? You want to live this way? You want to put mushrooms in your mouth? You want to go a trip somewhere? We took some mushrooms one time. We missed the whole show. I spent thousands. All the money I could, I spent on dumb jerseys like this. I could have been spending on college, on an education. All the money I spent on Fago, I had it stockpiled, six feet high. I bring it to school, I say, I don't need lunch, I'm gonna drink Fago. It turned my shit green. You wanna start fresh? You want to you wanna get your life together? Drop the makeup, drop the fago, get rid of it all. Spend your money on something that could help you. You got all this clown makeup. How, how many pillow sheets have you wrecked? Use your nugget. Drop the ninja, drop the clown. Become a productive member of society. You think you got... Our approach was working. Under Curtis's guidance, Jake was finally on his long road to recovery. Take it from me, living this lifestyle is not worth all the cotton candy in the world. If I could just save one poor kid from this meaningless lifestyle of being a ninja, then I have done my job and I can sleep better at night knowing that I made somebody do better and be more of a productive member of society. I don't want to do this. You gotta do this. You gotta do this. One step closer, you pour the fago out, you get one step closer. No, 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 no. You pour it in there, not in there. All right, here. I'm throwing away the cap, dump it out. One step closer, there you go. Just get a little bit more. A a a no, you pour it out. No, no, oh, no. Family! Oh, man, I'm sorry, bro. Oh, no. Woo! 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 No, 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 no. It's, it's, it's okay. Cherry pie! Cherry pie! No, it's, it's, it's okay. Family! Woo! 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 Curtis? You've been in there for a while now. Are you all right? Curtis? Next time on Juggalo Rehab, I handled my most desperate case yet, a Juggalo talk show host. Oh dear.
we're here with Russ White, a local artist from the Twin Cities. Russ, thanks for coming. Thanks for having me. Um, so what made you pick Micro Machines, the, if, you don't, if you're not familiar, uh, little toy, small little cars? What made you pick Micro Machines, I guess, as your theme for this show? Uh, well, I started doing uh, sort of satirical drawings of vehicles um, uh, a year or two ago uh, on a smaller scale. And the sort of satirical uh, options that these things uh, present, you know, you can do a school bus, you can do, you know, I've done a military Humvee, a cop car. They stand in for larger institutions really sure. easily. Um, and they're also really fun to draw. So I kind of developed this body of work over time and noticed there was kind of an underlying theme of um, childhood, and like addressing uh, assumptions and um, problems and stresses from childhood and I thought well you know micro machines that was a, a toy that I played with as a kid you know sure. little everyone did little matchbox cars things um, and but these are you know 40 by 60 drawings so they're big so sure. macro there's kind of that obvious joke uh, but it's also kind of about you know the things that we bring with us uh, from childhood into adulthood and how they grow up with us. So previously you worked mostly in illustrating and printmaking, but mm -hmm. for this exhibit you'll have some photographs and some installations. Yep. Is that uh, like a leap you've been wanting to make uh, into new mediums, or is that something that just seemed to make sense with this show? I think I approach each concept kind of like what medium would best serve the concept. And, you know, there's some of the sculptural installations are things, uh, at least in this show, are things that could really have been drawings, but it, it kind of made sense, well, let's just bring it into the space instead of just having the drawing on the wall. You know, I couldn't bring a school bus into it, but I could bring a radio flyer wagon into it, for instance. Sure. Uh, first, I want to talk about is the Caprice Classic. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, so I guess what are you, like, what, what's the message you're trying to send there? Uh, so when I was a kid in the 80s, my parents had uh, the Chevy Caprice Classic uh, mm -hmm. station wagon. For sure. The idea behind Caprice Classic was take uh, something, in this case, uh, I think it's a World War II era uh, tank, and then sort of clad it in uh, something that was very familiar and very safe from my own childhood that I wouldn't really think twice about and then kind of relate how, you know, I think a lot of our preconceived notions about American military might. Okay, the uh, last one I want to talk about is there's an installation of uh, planes that you'll be hanging from the ceiling yep. and I'm told those planes were models made by your father. Yep. Is he an artist as well, or was that just kind of a hobby for uh, him? No, he's a minister, actually. Oh, um, really? Yeah, he's a retired Presbyterian minister. Uh, no, those were models that he made uh, in the 50s when he was a little kid. Right. The, the sort of punchline of that piece is that there's sort of a small child's desk, and on it is a, a model being built of a Predator drone. And, uh, and so okay. there's the old, and then there's the new, and there's sort of a dialogue between the two. Sure. And it's very similar to the Caprice Classic tank piece, talking about our assumptions about, you know, the heroism of, you know, uh, uh, the pilots in those jets and, you know, it's this gung-ho attitude. You can't, when you take Tom Cruise out of the cockpit, yeah. it gets a little bit different. But then you're sort of like, but it's kind of maybe the same thing. Yeah. Maybe it's better. Maybe it's worse. Yeah. I'm not sure. Not only are you an artist, you also are a board member on the Northeast Minneapolis Arts Association mm -hmm. and also recently you've been doing interviews for MPLS Art, the mm -hmm. website. Um, what made you want to get involved in the art scene beyond just being an artist? Well, mostly uh, we moved here almost, almost two years ago and mostly it was that I didn't know anybody. Sure. And uh, so as soon as we moved here, I knew that Northeast was the place to be. Sure. I had, you know, we'd come for Art of World in years past, and um, so I just emailed all of the building owners and was like, does anybody have a studio? And uh, uh, Jennifer at uh, Casket Arts had a great space for me, so I moved right in, and that was, I think, four days before uh, Art of World 2014, so I had I mean, just a matter of days to get everything sure. up on the wall and make it look oh, like so you I had actually, a sale. 
Yeah, like wow. I had, I was there for four days and then had thousands of Minnesotans coming through my door. And I'm just like, hello, <laughs> wow. nice to meet you all. I don't That's know anyone crazy. here. <laughs> uh, so that was a really great introduction to the scene. You know, it's a great way to start. Yeah, that's the best you know? networking, yeah. like talking to people. And yeah, I got really involved uh, in uh, helping, you know, manage events and organize events at uh, Casket Arts. And then um, the NEMA board approached me about joining up and I thought oh, sure yeah, that sounds cool. like fun yeah um, and then for MPLS art um, I think they were doing like a giveaway or something they were doing like uh, like a poster giveaway or something and uh, I just donated some artwork to that and that's how I got to know cool. Katie and Blaine sure and then they were like do you know any writers and I was like well yeah I write yeah sure <laughs> I figured that would be a good way again not knowing that much about the city sure as a way to you know a good excuse to go around and see all the galleries and meet people and interview them and yeah absolutely uh, it's been great yeah how long have you been growing your beard <laughs> uh, <laughs> I get asked that all the time uh, <laughs> the last time I was clean shaven I think was 2002 yeah wow. summer of 2002 um, so yeah, that's the last time I was f fully clean shaven. Okay. I mean, I have a beard too. Yeah, I get salad dressing in it all the time. Sure. What do you do about that? Uh, eat, eat less salad. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so would you say you're a save the flavor for later kind of guy, or no? You got to keep it clean, okay. man. That, yeah. That's gross. Yeah. All right, that's good. No, I I'm mean, glad. Yeah. I mean, I mean it looks gotta, pretty clean from here. Well, so. thank you. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, once again, Macro Machines is at Gamut Gallery, uh, April 2nd to April 23rd. For more information on that, you go to gametgallerympls.com. For more information on Russ, russ-white.com. Mm -hmm. That's that. Thank you, That's, Russ. Thanks for having me, man. Yeah.